What's interesting is is that you know the other doctrine that they were working on and was is called the United Kingdom. Be be wary of that term, the United Kingdom of the world, uh, because they wanted to establish that so that their grand monarch, as they talk about him in the secret societies, would be the ruler of the world and sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. This is the dragon messiah. This is the uh, the uh, elven blood bloodline of the Magianic dragon that they've been plotting to put there forever. And anything that is associated with Templarism is the antithesis of Christianity as it's meant to be and anything that's written in the Bible. And we're told over and over and over and over not to swear oaths and that you will be held accountable for those oaths. If you swear that oath, then you had better fulfill it because God will hold you accountable for it. But we're advised not to over and over and over. And yet, this is based on an oath-based system in the mystical religions, and that all goes back to the oath sworn on Mount Hermon before the flood, and then again after the flood. And it's the oath of the watchers to carry it out to the end, the oath of harem anathema, no matter what the consequences, no matter what would happen to them, they were going to create a race to lead humanity into destruction. And that's their purpose. So the purpose of the Templars is to recreate the scenario to destroy humanity. And they do that through creating their worldwide hegemony that we will understand with the coming end time and all the different horrors that you see in prophecy, particularly against humans and particularly in a more spiteful way against anybody who stands against them, like monotheists, Christians, um, the, they will express that blood hatred uh, just as the Amalekites and the giants swore oaths to wipe Israel from the face of the earth um, in the time of uh, the you know the age of Israel and its creation and throughout its uh, history. That they are using the Book of Revelation as a playbook for uh, the other side. Yeah, and and we see that being fulfilled and what. You know, talked about banking for an example and you know the Rothschilds were set up as bankers outside the church after the fall of the Templars. The Templars were the largest banking organization um, you know that was ever created to that time and created all the platforms for modern banking as we understand it today so they needed to replace it both inside and outside the church and the Rothschilds were the sponsors of the whole Zionist movement and the iconology that they use with the Star of David comes in at the same time to put Israel back into the land of the covenant so that they could bring forward the uh, end time um, rendezvous with destiny that they want to have and the Rothschilds were, were originally named the Bauer family were funded by the secret societies uh, and the bloodlines to be to become that banking such uh, um, organizational structure and so we ought not to look at that they that Israel being in the land of the covenant isn't the fulfillment of prophecy because it is, because we know Israel or the southern kingdom more accurately is in the covenant land in the time of the Ezekiel War in 38 and 39, and that they're in control of Jerusalem um, in times of the signing of the seven-year covenant in Daniel 9:27, and permitted to do the sacrifice, and in control of Jerusalem as the epicenter for those first three and a half years until they flee to the wilderness 
as talked about in in the book of Revelation and in the in the four gospels. So what we're not told biblically in eschatology is how that remnant shows up for the end time. And yeah. again, this is all happening through free choice. And so this has been made available to bring a scenario for the end time because of the polytheists. They understand end time prophecy as well. They have a different view on the outcome, but they know that that has to have they have to have Israel in place if they're going to bring about the end time. And so I think that was their gambit. But that that should not, we should not look poorly on that, whether or not all the people are Jewish root or not. What we do need to know is, is that they need to be in the covenant land and in control of Jerusalem in the end time. And then once they're there, we apply the prophecies that we've been provided throughout the Old and New Testament. Yeah, I've got a a friend who I actually met through. Um, I originally met him through YouTube. Him watching my YouTube videos and commenting on them, and then we eventually started emailing, and then. Uh, talking through facebook messenger uh because it's got the you know the video calls and whatnot but his family um he's a uh, what you would consider a, a palestinian jew you know he didn't come from europe yep. Yep. but his his family has literally been there for three thousand years um you know israel of course, became a nation in 48, but Jews have, you know, they've been there, you know, throughout history, just not as, I guess, a, a recognized um, nation okay. by the rest yep. of the world. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so... I guess I guess you know if you look at the Knights Templar, they were the most powerful military organization at that time, uh, and this organization moves back to to Europe and it changes the whole trajectory in so many different ways of of the West, and that this is an organizational structure that's connected to. Sufis, and who has a similar goal and agenda. Now, those are different bloodlines. Uh, and we should also understand then that there will be Mahdi's, as they call them in Islam, uh, one Sunni, one Shia. Who knows? Well, they, there might be a Sufi one as well. And they're going to do battle in the end time. One of the things that most people don't realize is that um, not only were they the most powerful military organization, the most powerful financial organization, but they were provided in a series of papal bulls additional powers and autonomy to the point where Pope Gregory, he passed a bull that didn't permit any oversight of the Knights Templar by any bishops within the Roman Church, and that they were able to um, appoint their own priests. They had their own religion within the religion and were given the power to do so by the popes. And wow. they, were, they were a complete law unto themselves. And so they were, yeah, they were doing all sorts of different things um, in terms of intrigue um, that was not sitting well with the church or with a number of the kings. Um, but 
there was you could you could make a long list as to why you would want to get rid of them but they were so powerful so you you had to have one of the more powerful kings along with the pope to get together to be able to bring them down but they still didn't make them completely disappear that's how powerful they were and they're that powerful yeah. because they're all bloodlines so they come with power and unless and so you know even when the even when the jesuits were dismantled in in the 1800s they found protection in prussia and in eastern europe um and i mean the early 1800s when they were taken down and they were easily reassembled in the 1800s with the resurgence of the mary apparitions which is really directly connected to the jesuits as well um, from their organization um, beginnings um, because their organization was just underground awaiting an opportunity to come back and in this it was the pope who was in france in prison by the king of yeah. france who decides he's going to start bringing back the templars they're the jesuits because the new templars because he needs protection from the royals so there's always this intrigue that's going on throughout our history and one might expect that they're going to play a role in the end time and particularly with a modern version as the jesuits understanding we have a jesuit jesuit place yeah there. Mm -hmm. yeah so if in those trunk organizations are the rebuttal to the taking down of the centralized uh knights templar so freemasonry is created uh and they have a specific agenda that you know has to do with the army controlling uh, the military and politics uh, the illuminati is created to uh, destroy christianity and work on world government and they work through the leviathan reach of the lodges of freemasonry as it's set up around the world <coughs> to do so then you have the <coughs> rosicrucians which controls all the literature, the media, and the entertainment, and is the source to the modern versions of polytheism that we saw come downstream in Gnosticism, Theosophy, and New Age, and that they are controlling um those and overseeing those other two orders below that are reporting up to the rosicrucians up to the committee of 300 that dominates all of the banking that dominates um so many organizations whether it's world bank whether or not it's the international monetary fund whether or not it's world trade whether or not it's the davos community on and on and on is controlled by the committee of 300 because money is the source of their power and if people think that bill gates or bezos or musk are the real wealth that's a drop in the bucket and the off the books wealth that is stored in switzerland um, is astronomical we have no idea how large that wealth is um, well i was trying to do research on it when i was writing book one and in the early 2000s i was given some numbers they're all over the map but the consistent number range at that time of off the books wealth of the europeans was three to 500 trillion. And so now we're over 20 years later, you can only imagine what that wealth would be. And uh, that's how they stay in power. So they make sure that this world is run through the oligopolies and they're moving to a more formalized oligopoly for the end time. 
and uh, it's just part of that organizational structure, but it's the money. And then all of that money and that organization that's in the committee of 300 that report into that, they're reporting up to, you know, the 33 families and the 13 families in the West. But understand there are other bloodlines around the world and they have their organizational structures as well. And people who say to me that uh, digital currency will take away all of the embezzlement and the ability to control things via printing money. I just laugh because it will make it easier. I mean, it, it literally goes from having to print paper to just typing in the number. Yeah, it, it moves on steroids on how they can manipulate it. And you won't see that digital cryptocurrency come until they, they get some of the AI technology up to speed, which is why Davos uh, received the instructions that until until you get better AI out there, we can't move forward. And they've had a big push on that this year. They need to have control over the Daemon algorithms. Um, because if you combine digital currency, which fits in perfectly with quantum mechanics and quantum computing and AI, uh, you have the ability to decode and crack anything, even in cryptocurrency from other dimensions. And so you need an advancement of these invisible algorithms that they call daemons, invisible as in the invisible ones that are you know, like to be in the background. The invisible ones are the true invisible ones of the spirit realm who govern yeah. this world from the council of the gods. But they want to be able to control things from behind the algorithms with these uh, streams that they that their money, their information, their technology can't be cracked uh, by anybody. And so they're okay. still working on all of that before they bring in that digital currency. Um, and they also have the ability to convert that uh, into nothing and bring out all of their gold because they've got uh -huh. all the gold that's been rounded up over the millennia uh, stored away as well, that they'll just reassert a, gold, uh, a new type of gold standard when everything collapses. And there sure ain't none in the Federal Reserve or Fort Knox. Yeah, it went somewhere, <laughs> didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Now, what is that? I, I know it's a different subject, but that that you were just talking about the algorithm, the invisible. I don't. I, I can't pronounce the word you use, but I've well, never heard of that. Yeah, it's it, it's the Greek word to daemon, and oh, it's, so that's it's the, the word for demon. Yeah, <laughs> um, and. So yeah, it's uh, they they do everything in plain sight, but that's the term that they like to use for those invisible algorithms that control the outcomes behind the scenes. And so wow. they need to get they need to get more secure and better at that, so that they can absolutely control and manipulate everything and not, you know, suffer some sort of cyber attack themselves. So. I know that's probably not the right word at that level of technology, but whatever the word is for that, they're still working on that. So they've tested the cryptocurrency. They like it. They want it. It's not secure enough for the the, the real money in this world. So they'll be uh, working on, you know, as, as we've seen with the instructions or working to get that in place. And, you know, even when you see like, you know, Google AI, um, Elon Musk's, and I like Elon Musk a lot, but I, I'm, I, I'm also very, very careful because there's white hats and black hats, but they all worship the same pantheon. He's creating AI because he thinks the Google AI is evil and his is going to be good AI. 
I have to say, even though I like Musk a lot, there's no such thing as good AI. Yeah, I, 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 I think, um, you know, I, he's got a very likable personality for sure, and I don't dislike him or anyone else. Um, and I think he probably has good intentions for you know the things that he does with things like the counter ai if you could call it that but his, like his um brain interface technology to try to make <laughs> <laughs> uh, humans be able to compete with ai but uh, regardless of his intentions um like you said there, there's no such thing as a good ai and transhumanism isn't good either i mean even if it only led to a ready player one type world and there were no end times implications it still wouldn't be good yeah yeah none none of it leads to any any good outcomes um, but we're racing in that direction. And uh, I think it's because of the same motivation that there was to create the nation of Israel, is they want to get things in place for the end time because they want to bring that about. Absolutely. A lot of people just aren't aware of just how much was done and had to happen for the nation state of Israel to be brought into being like uh, <laughs> World War One was all but over before it really began <laughs> before the Rothschild blackmailed uh, Europe into you know the balfour uh deal and getting which got america into the war and got it started for real and you know it's just there's i i don't believe by any means that the the Zionists or the the Rothschilds are godly in the sense of being polytheistic or that they are even trying to do the right thing. But, you know, I, I, I agree with you to some extent that it is absolutely um, prophetic. You know, God chooses how prophecy is fulfilled. You know, man may think that he's <laughs> controlling things, but God just looks and laughs. <laughs> and yep. yep. And no matter how the spurious forces around the world try they cannot bring about the end time before the ordained time correct um, but there is an ordained time and they are working to bring it about and and i think it's also one of the confusions that goes into understanding some end time prophecy particularly with the uh, the seal and, and the trumpet judgments those are not brought by god they're brought by those who run this world and uh, they're contrived um, but they're trying to bring about their dragon messiah and they're going to need an armageddon like war for his credentials so we need to understand that the things that happen in this world happen because it's permitted to happen through free choice for a certain period of time. And there is a time that uh, only God knows when Jesus is going to return, uh, even though we're told to watch and uh, understand the seasons. But 
this world and all the horrible things happening in it has nothing to do with God. He has given us the gift of life. He has given us the opportunity to have our names in the book of life and to choose to have to continue forever or not, or to have our names left in the book of life or blotted out, our choice. All the things that have happened that are evil in this world happens through that free choice. And it's not the way God would like to see things played out, but he's greater than free choice, that he's Alpha yeah. Omega. So Absolutely. He, and so there is a specific time, and I think we are indeed in the fig tree generation, and we need to get very clear-eyed about what happened, what is, and what's going to come, and understand that we're going to get a lot of disinformation, misinformation, propaganda, uh, persecution, um, cancellation, all the things that we see going on. It's only going to get stronger and worse as they bring about this dystopian new new world order, the new Atlantis that they say they want to bring, yeah. bring about. Um, but that has to happen. It's going to continue to move forward. We can push it back with, you know, more... Uh, God worship and more evangelization of, of people to follow God. But at the end of the day, there's a godless generation that yes. is reserved. There's a fig tree generation that is reserved. There is the days of Noah, which can also be understood as a generation, as you take that back to its Greek and its Hebrew meanings as generation. Um, there is that generation where all of these things that Jesus has predicted will be fulfilled. So it will uh, come. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that the preterists misunderstand when they, you know, they see Jesus say, you know, this generation, they think, and they use that passage constantly that he was talking about that specific generation. So when the temple was destroyed, then everything was fulfilled. But, you know, it's like you said, it, he was talking about the fig tree generation. And yeah, that's right. It, but they, it, but they it, ignore it, inconvenient it, passages. Absolutely. And, and the other thing that is really interesting um, is that even where they're talking about all things are being fulfilled, they're going against what Daniel 9 says, that there's one week of years when all vision and prophecy is going to be fulfilled and Jesus comes in to rule. And that week has not happened yet. <laughs> and it's just amazing that they like to separate that out. And that happens in the end time, the Hebrew word cats. Daniel 9.26 used twice. And that when they're talking about this little season that is supposed to last, and I've, see, I've heard so many different versions of it, and again, people can believe what they want to believe, but it sh you shouldn't have to reinvent what the Bible says, and you should not have to leave out inconvenient passages. So they say this little season is something like, some people say up to almost 2,000 years, probably starting from the time of the destruction of, of Jerusalem. Some people say it's only 300 years. They have a different time frame on it because there's no scriptural reference that they're basing it on. And yeah. that they say the little season is when Satan has been let out and he's ruling the world again today. And that's why there isn't a memory of anything except that. That's not possible because when you look at Revelation 20, Jesus and the saints are still ruling in Jerusalem. There's not this rule of Satan that's talked about. He's out to gather an army. And even the Armageddon army takes less than a year to be gathered, which Satan is involved on. So when we look at that word, the little season, they're taking it right out of its context of its yeah, meaning. Yeah, I mean, and that comes after Armageddon anyway. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you're right. So many people are are believing that we are in the the little season that's in between the 
the reign of Christ and when Satan is finally, uh, you know, thrown in the, the lake of fire for eternity, there's really so much evidence to the contrary just in the scriptures. Yeah. Um, before well, Jesus was ever crucified, he said that uh, Satan was the god of this world. Um, when he was tempted by Satan, when Satan said all of these kingdoms, took him up on the the high mountain, said all of these kingdoms have been given unto me and I can give them to whoever I want. Jesus didn't say, you liar. <laughs> um, yeah. He quoted scripture to him. Yeah. They're, they're, they're Satan's kingdoms until they're not, which is exactly. at the end of the end of the end time and then he's released and he's going to try and take his kingdom back and so this little season when you take that back to to the greek that's little as in micros uh -huh. which literally means small short little and chronos which means season and that we get one other application for little season Micros Kronos, and that happens in Revelation six, where um, they're told the uh, those the people waiting, the ones with the white robes are waiting before the throne. They're told to wait for a little season. So the yes. biblical application, the furthest you could stretch that is three and a half years. Season could also be understood as just a season or three three months, but it's also could be defined as a period of time, which is why you have micros put there as in a little season, small season. And in passages in the New Testament, where it's a longer period of time, it's not left for granted. And so you get passages as in, in, in 20, Matthew 25, 19, Acts 8, 11, 14, 3, 28, and 2 Peter 2, 3, where it is a long period or a yeah. long chronos. Um, and so it's defined, so it's not, able to be expanded but you have to ignore the other applications and you know that word and that's used in revelation 20 begins with and right after uh, armageddon and, and and antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire and it says the word and and that's the greek word kahi and it's used to 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 define the when, as in the next thing that happens and happens immediately after. It's the same application as tota when Jesus is giving his chronology, which means then, as it's translated, it's the when. And is used throughout all of Revelations so that you know that this is the next thing that is coming. And it yeah. happens quickly. And, and is used throughout Revelation 20 in all of those things. And then this happens, and then this happens. It is sequ sequential, and there isn't this big space. And it, all you have is he's let out for a little season. And you could, if you wanted to expand it to um, three and a half years, I think you could do that. Uh, but I think it's probably, and just as it would be time for those saints in the first three and a half years in Revelation 7 that they're being that they're waiting for in Revelation 6, but I think we're looking at probably a year or less. Um, and you have to, like I say, you know, you have to absolutely butcher and mangle scripture to get there. And all that happens is when you challenge preterists and Tartarian preterism and all the other different nuances is, is they come out with what I call chase the rabbit arguments. So yeah. people, people should not be caught into that. They never answer your Absolutely. challenge. They just say, what about this? And what about that? Yeah. Uh, and that, that's a, that, again, that's a Gnostic uh, a tactic. Yeah. Uh, one thing is for sure. Um, it, does not happen until after Jesus returns, and Jesus absolutely has not returned. And why would he flee Jerusalem? 
<laughs> yeah, I he's mean, ra- when he's really. raining there, and and he let Satan out. Yeah, so I he's mean, not. A, I mean, it, nothing about it makes sense, but it's it's crazy how popular the idea is, and uh, it's uh, it's a shame because. This is the type of ways that are going to be used to wedge Christianity and to deceive Christianity. This is if we can't properly role model, then we're going to do more harm than good when people need us the most. You are absolutely right, and that's why it's so important to make disciples not to not just you know uh share the gospel and someone come to christ and then be forgotten about because uh you better believe the other side the other team they don't just uh win converts and leave them alone you know they don't win them and forget about them and people are interested by it because they have people willing to show them the power in it. And what the sad thing is, is the true power is in Jesus Christ. The true power is in the believer, the spirit-filled believer. Here in North America, the freedom that we have in both Canada and the United States, it is truly more of a hindrance for Christians in the fig tree generation, especially when we get to the Great Tribulation, than it will be for people who are used to living with real tribulation they have had to go through true persecution you know they their lives or their well-being or their family's well-being and safety is on the line just because they are associated with jesus christ and there's not many of us at least not in america who can say that now, I'm sure there is coming a time a lot sooner than a lot of us believe when that will be the case, but it, it's not here yet, and because it's coming is the reason that I say that the fact that we have been both so very free and so very deceived at the same time it's made for (laughs) really the the what you see in the church of laodicea yep i agree brother gary i want to thank you so much for coming on with us and i thank you all for joining us Until next time, God bless each and every one of you.